All right, good morning. Welcome to um, day two of our beginner training. And um, very first, I wanna apologize for my sunlight here. My uh, window shades are closed, but you know, it's just that kind of day, but it'll get better as we go. <laughs> um, so uh, just to start off here, we are starting from the uh, very same spot that we left off with after day one. Um, in the PowerPoint. And today we are going to talk about um, budgeting, periodic menu, extracts, and the system options. Now, the um, items that Pat talked about yesterday from the first two menus, from the core and the transaction menu, are very much things that are used regularly. Um, you know, they might be more widely used by um, those at the district, if they're entering requisitions uh, through USAS, um, these items that we're talking about today are more specific to either like a time of year or um, uh, a certain function. So um, like budgeting, it might just happen a couple of times a year. Periodic, we're definitely going to see some things that just happen at fiscal year end. And um, system is one I think you'll use year round, but that's a little bit more specific to you at the ITC versus something that uh, the districts would use. So um, let me hop out of this real quick. Now, who would I be if I didn't start in the wiki? Because um, that's where I do usually start off here. Um, but what I want to do is I want to show where you can find that PowerPoint. So if you're picking up on the training today, if you are catching this recording before the first one, um, I just want to review where this is. So I'm scrolling down here and we're going to go to the SSDT meetings and trainings. And on this page, um, this ITC training and registration, this is either where you would have signed up or maybe where you are catching the recording from. Um, but if you look down here under training materials, we have this overview beginner training page and we've totally revamped this page this year. So we wanted to put a little bit more on, on here, um, make this a little bit easier if you're referencing back later to find um, specific parts even of this recording. So um, first and foremost, we have the agenda. We have the PowerPoint, which we'll come back to. And then here are the direct links to the user manual, which we will be in today, and the appendix, uh, which will also be in today. <laughs> um, and, and if you scroll down here, we're actually gonna break down each of these trainings with timestamps of the recording. So um, if you are, and I'm so sorry, I have to scroll here, but um, if you're catching this recording and there's something that you really wanna see in this one, um, once we get this all posted and all, um, you know, we'll get this all split out um, so that you can, can use this. But um, say the cash reconciliation is what you're looking for, you can come to this page and this eventually will be a link that you can click it'll take you to this same recording to the point where I talk about the cash reconciliation. So um, if that's something that um, you're catching this after the fact and you need, um, you know, we hope that'll be really convenient for you. Okay, so um, let me, I'm just gonna go back here so I don't have to scroll as much. Um, okay, so, oh, you know what? Gosh darn it. I wanted to look at the PowerPoint. Okay, one more time. <laughs> Overview beginner training. And so we've linked to the PowerPoint here. We do have it as like um, a Google PowerPoint, a Google slide. Um, so I have it here. This is what it'll look like for you. So you'll be able to open this in view mode and you can see any of the slides. And if you do want to take this to a PowerPoint to save and um, customize for yourself, like maybe you just want a couple of these slides um, that you can build off of for a training that you're going to give to your districts, you can go file, download, and then you can um, save it to a PowerPoint. Um, or maybe you just want to pull this up to go through as I'm training today. Um, I'll tell you, I probably will not jump to the PowerPoint too much, um, but this does align with all the things I'm going to be talking about today. So it's good for um, note taking and reference. All right, now, okay, so let's actually go to the USAS user manual from this page instead of, instead of scrolling. <laughs> 
Um, because the first topic we're going to talk about is budgeting. And um, what we'll do, we'll go look at these pages. Um, oh, let's just leave this here for now. Let's go into the software. Um, okay. So once we're in here, so yesterday we covered core and transaction, we're on to budgeting and we have two options under budgeting. We have scenarios and we have proposed amounts. The scenarios, so this is kind of like your building section. Um, you're going to um, start building the sheets that you'll have your um, budgeting amounts in. And then eventually we'll see how you push those to proposed amounts. And that's kind of your on deck area. Once they are um, showing in proposed amounts, that is when they'll show as like next year proposed on the account. Um, so scenarios is the very first step here. So if we click into here, um, now let's go. So this is so these are the pages we're looking at, but I'm also going to pull up the wiki. So if I come back here, I'm just going to click on um, budgeting from that main menu. And you'll see we have this note here. When it comes to budgeting, um, this is like, this is what we talk about in our budgeting training too. These little walkthroughs that you have linked at the bottom of this page are extremely helpful. So um, click here, four steps to create proposed amounts for next fiscal year. So if I wanna start building my fiscal year 23 um, proposed amounts, I have a walkthrough for that. Or if I'm still in 2022 and I want to um, go ahead and make adjustments to the current year, I have a walkthrough for that. There are some differences. And so um, if you're going to be doing that, you know, you want to follow the one that's relevant to, to the situation that um, they are planning for. And just a minute. Trying to uh I think that works. All right. So um, we're going to let's just go ahead and look at the proposed amounts for next fiscal year. And you can see here it's got steps with the scenarios and the proposed amounts. So this is why this walkthrough is really convenient because you're going to be using both of these pages and this helps you map out what happens on each page. Um, so if we go back to the scenarios. Um, what happens here, so each of these are linked to a year. So if we're going to create a scenario, we would come in here and say we're going to do our um, our budgets for 2023. Okay, so what I want to do with this scenario is I want to put all of the budgets that are going to be pushed forward in one scenario. So this scenario will have my budgets and my um, and my anticipated revenues. So I wanna put everything that I'm gonna push forward together in one scenario. Um, the reason that you might have multiple scenarios for a year is if it's gonna be like these budget amounts or these budget amounts. So if I pass the tax levy, these will be my budgets. If I don't, these will be my budgets. I'm going to use one or the other. Um, there are ways where you could potentially do like waves of pushing a scenario forward, you know, so it's not that you can't do that. But um, when I actually push this scenario to the proposed amounts page, it's going to replace everything that's already there. So especially if this is something that um, you have a district that's newer with, or if you're just starting with this, my recommendation would be to just um, have them keep all of the same, uh, not all of the same, all of their budgets for a given fiscal year in one scenario. You can push that forward together just to make sure that they don't overwrite something they don't want to. Um, okay, so once, so this is just like the basics, but we don't really have anything here yet, right? So um, what we want to do is click this create in the bottom corner, and this is going to let us add a budgeting sheet. The budgeting sheet is where we actually pull in the accounts. Um, that's where we have a spot to enter what we want to budget. Um, so this is where we start to build that. 
And um, up in this top left corner is the first thing that I want to note here is this is your type. So this sheet that's within my scenario, um, do I want that to be budget accounts or do I want that to be revenue accounts? So let's go with budget. And we like to use the cafeteria fund because that has some codes, but not too many. So that's good for um, just, we want a quick look at what this will do. So I'm just gonna name, this is what my sheet's gonna be called uh, in this little grid when I get it. The select properties. So obviously this looks like if you have ever looked at kind of the guts of the report, which I know we're gonna get to those tomorrow, um, this very much looks like kind of customizing a report and it's built off of the same idea. So um, on the select properties grid, everything that you see here is going to be a column that we'll get on this budgeting sheet. So it's going to look kind of like a spreadsheet, and each one of these will be a different column. Um, if they want to add more things here, they can. So they might want to add, let's see, so we have a prior year expended, but we also have an option for two years um, prior and three years prior. So sometimes they want that too. So you can add that on here. Um, say maybe they don't really need the encumbrances. You can also delete things. And you can really change this around if you want. Um, the next tab is configure filters. And this is how we tell it, okay, we want this specific sheet to only be cafeteria. So I'm going to put a filter on here that I want only accounts where the fund equals 006. And then once I have this set how I want it, um, I'm going to go ahead, save this sheet, and create it. Okay, successful. And then I can see it in this little grid on my scenario. So when they build these, what this is eventually going to look like is, you know, they might have their budgets for the general fund, for athletics, um, for their PI fund. And so they might build a different sheet for each of those because they might be working on those budgets with a different department. So it's nice to have them kind of separated out and contained into a spreadsheet. But, um, but if they're all within this same scenario, then they can all be pushed forward together. Um, so next, let's, I wanna talk about these different options you get once you're on the grid. And um, once you are on this grid, um, let's go ahead and click this edit button because this really shows us what we created. Um, we have the uh, description, the account code. So all of these columns were from that report view. Uh, we have the two years prior, three years prior that we added. Um, so all of that is there. But we also have this last column. This last column, it's always going to start with PA. But depending on the year that you are um, actually um, wanting to enter proposed amounts for, that's what year is going to show there. Um, if you are, you know, say creating adjustments for this year instead, then um, you, you want to check this and change that. If it's not the correct year, you can manually like edit this. Um, but we're doing we're doing um, proposed budgets for 23, so um, we'll leave that. The other thing you can do in here is this does work like an Excel spreadsheet in some ways. So um, I can use formulas. Uh, say my fiscal today um, expendable, let's see, expendable, ex maybe I want the expended, you know, this is how much I spent this year, which I've, however they'd want to do this, what they can do is they can go um, equals and then, you know, click on another column just like they would in Excel and they can drag that down and that would populate this formula in this last column so that they could just match their budget, um, their proposed amount, uh, proposed budget for this year to you know, what it was last year or what was expended last year. So that's kind of like a, a quick way to go if there's a situation that they would use that. 
Once I'm done with my changes, I want to click accept. Um, here's the other big note here. Make sure to click save. Um, sometimes, like especially if they're first creating this, like if you just X out of it, you will lose the sheets within here too. Like it won't save at all unless you save it up here. So I'd almost recommend, oh, I have um, one that's already named that. Let's make it a B. Okay, so um, once I have this saved, like I can always edit this and add more sheets. I have um, some flexibility there, but um, you know, just you just want to make sure you don't lose anything. Next is this regenerate option. So when we're generating the sheet, um, let me just double check my notes here because this one's important. Um, so if you're going to regenerate the sheet, what this is going to do now, some of these figures from the current year, when we're looking at this, like here's the fiscal to date, expendable, expended. So as they're going, like if they had just created these sheets, maybe they hadn't actually put in their budgets yet. If they want to regenerate it, they can with the current figures. Um, however, it also regenerates the last column. So if they've entered anything in this, um, they may they, they lose that. So you want to be careful of when you're using that regenerate so that if they've entered anything um, for their proposed amounts, they don't lose it if they don't want to. Um, but of course, a situation like this where they're using a formula, they could just go pop the formula in there again. So that's the regenerate option. Um, the other thing, and you know what, let's actually just click this. The other thing is this would also um, bring up this view. So if they wanted to add another column or take off a column or maybe like add another, um, you know, change the filter so that they could have two funds in there. Uh, so that just gives them the, the flexibility to adjust that without having to fully like delete and redo a sheet. These last two here work together, kind of. Um, so download is going to let you take that sheet and put it right to Excel. So uh, this would be, let me, let's go into my other screen, hang on. Um, just a minute here. Okay, so this looks just like what um, when we did the edit. This was this was the um, all of the same columns, the same totals, and it brings it to Excel. Now, what I could do, say I decided, you know, I want to. Oops, I got any more editing. <laughs> um, say I want to manually enter some here. Like I'm meeting with. Uh, you know, I'm meeting with the assistant super who works on some of some of the budgets and we go through, we add their figures here and um, get that all set. Good to go. Then I could save this. And then what I can do is I can do upload and replace. OK, upload and replace. Well, I added more budgets, so I do want it to be replaced. And I could go choose file, pick that spreadsheet that I saved, start upload, and um, that will go ahead and just replace this sheet in here with the budgets I've added. The other option, if you do have a spreadsheet that's like pre-built, you know, say, and I know that we're like in a situation where, you know, more are on redesign now than, than coming over from classic, but if you do have districts, you know, that are migrating within this time period right now, um, it, it is interesting because they're starting their budgeting. If they're in classic, but switching to redesign, um, one thing that they might have used in classic is the bud work. Um, I know that one was really popular. They would um, take that, put all their budgets in there and then um, import. So this upload option will handle a bud work. Um, if you click upload and then um, we have to give it a name. Uh, classic budgets, and then I could choose that file and upload. So they do have an option to still be able to get those budgets in here um, from a spreadsheet, from a spreadsheet. 
if they have them already in the system, um, they will actually come over into the proposed remote grid. Uh, so when we see that, um, keep that in mind. When we get over that grid, keep that in mind. The the trick there, and and this only happens like when they first migrate. If they migrated with with next year proposed entered, um, they'll go to the proposed amounts grid, but they won't have a scenario because scenarios didn't exist in classic. So if you have a district in that situation, um, be very careful of like pushing another scenario over or deleting those budgets out of there because in that case then you wouldn't have like uh you wouldn't have a scenario to like re-promote so um just a note there um okay so let's see so let's see if this um the other thing and um just while we're talking about this upload option is within this is our um walkthrough here and, and this goes through all the options we're talking about. So this upload option does have some report definitions. If they don't want to do the step where they're like making the sheet and then downloading it and using that, um, if they feel more comfortable with a report directly from the reports manager, we do have some options here um, for them. I mean, they contain similar information, but just you know a different option if they want that. And this is a JSON file. So you could just click right on this and then import that to the reports library, um, to the report manager, which we'll be looking at how to do that um, in more specifics tomorrow. But just to note that that is available. And if you use one of those reports, you would also use it with this upload option. Okay, so let's save that up. And okay, um, so I well, what I'm not actually going to promote this because I know I already have figures there and I want to just go ahead and show you those. But here's our budgets if I wanted when I'm ready when I have everything in my budgeting sheet, all my budgeting sheets in my scenario. Um, and I'm ready to go my next step would be to promote this scenario forward so I would click this promote it does give me a warning and tell me, hey, this is gonna replace everything for this fiscal year that's in your proposed grid. Like, are you sure you wanna do that? So, um, you know, especially when districts are first adapting to this process, like we really tried to make sure that there are, um, there's some text in here that really lets them know what's going on. Uh, so then we're gonna go to the proposed amounts next. And this is the grid. So um, let me pick 23 here. Um, so once I'm in here, so say I promoted that and I had previously promoted one already that was for the cafeteria fund. So um, I have um, a line for each of those rows that were on any of the spreadsheets, any of the budgeting sheets that were in my scenario. And it shows the amount, it shows the account code. If I wanted to edit this to like, so this would be maybe like the treasurer has gotten all the budgets from their departments, put them in the scenario, they push them over to propose, but then they need to make their tweaks. That's what I think this step, if you're going to be editing these budgets would be for. Um, it's really easy. So just edit, change the amount and save. Now, this step I like to think of as sort of a holding area. So, you know, of course they can still make these, these little changes in here, make these tweaks before they fully apply. Um, this is the stage like pretty much for this time of year right now, up until the fiscal year that it's kind of important for these to be. Um, so let me, I should have written down one of my account codes earlier, but let me just make a note here. All right, so what I wanna show you is, what, what is this doing? What does this mean? You know, it's a holding area. So um, I'm hopping back over to accounts real quick and let's go to this expenditure account. And let me look up this fund or this uh, account code. So when we view this, 
Now I can see this next year proposed, this very last line is 500. This figure right here is pulling directly from that proposed amounts grid. So because it's in this grid, it will show here. And you know what? So sometimes, so this will save us some time. I'm just going to open uh, two tabs with our instance so that we can look at the proposed amounts and we can look at um, this account page at the same time without having to navigate all the way back and forth. Uh, let's see. Actually, here, let's do this real quick. Let's just do 600, 600. We'll change that. We need to do a little refresh here. Okay, and see, so I changed that in my proposed grid, changed this to 600. Now it shows 600 in the next year proposed. So that is directly tied together. Um, one thing to watch out for, so as we talk about this next step, keep, keep that in mind. This specific field is coming from this specific grid. Um, now, when these are all set to go and ready to apply for next year, because what we want is July 1st, or like whenever they switch over their books so that July is the current period, they don't want this to show as next year proposed, then it needs to be the initial budget. So the way that we set that up is um, you have your fiscal year selected and then you click apply. And when you apply, this is where you determine like, is this gonna be um, you know, temporary or permanent or an adjustment? And when I actually apply this step, what it's doing is it's actually, um, see the effective date is 7-1-22. It's gonna go put um, a record out there that says, here's the initial budget for 7-1-22. So, um, so that's what applying does, but uh, sometimes it is uh, something that we've seen in the past where it's like, once this is applied, then people think that they can come delete this out of the grid but then they no longer have their next year proposed. So like those are kind of separate things. So the grid is next year, the um, proposed amounts grid is next year proposed. This application step is what's actually making them the budgets for next year. Um, while we're here, I'll mention, so temporary and permanent. Um, I will say there's not um, necessarily like a huge difference between these. Um, it really is timing, but um, so temporary is usually what they would use first. So they would put their temporary budgets there. Uh, there's like a little indicator in the background that says that it's temporary. Um, and then when they post their permanent budgets, that will replace the temporary budgets and um, be marked as permanent. Now, if a district posts a temporary budget, but then that ends up being their budget, they don't have to go repost as permanent. They don't. Um, it's just if they post a permanent, they can no longer post a temporary after that because it doesn't replace it. So really, um, it's just kind of like the order would generally be temporary and then permanent. Um, but it's it's mostly an indicator in the background they can use for reporting. Um, and um, they can kind of just use it at different points in the year, I guess. Adjustment is, um, if you look through, if, if you have a district wanting to do adjustments, that, that does work a little bit differently, um, just as far as like, you wanna make sure that the amounts you're putting in are what you want the expendable to be. Uh, I would definitely say, look through that walkthrough for doing adjustments. We also have like a fully in-depth um, budgeting training that happened in February that Michelle did. Um, and I believe she does a, I believe she did do an adjustment um, example in that one. So um, check that out if you want to go through the adjustments, but the pieces that you're using, you know, the scenarios that you're using, this grid that you're using, like these function um, the same. It's just the process that varies a little bit. Uh, let's see. Make sure we hit everything here. I think we did pretty good. Okay.
Okay, so we're going to move on to the periodic menu. Does anybody have any questions about um, about the scenarios, about the proposed amounts before we move on? Um, I'll give you a minute if you're typing those up, but I did also realize the one thing we didn't click was the, this other um, tab up here. So proposed budgets, we've been looking at expenditure accounts. That's what we did our whole example with. But I mentioned that you also would do this for your anticipated revenues. So um, your revenue accounts, and those are still within this page. They're just on this separate grid. But when I actually, you know, do this and click apply, it's going to apply for both sides. So um, just know these are here. They're just kind of separated out to make it a little bit more um, convenient to view these grids since they have different account pieces. All right. So next up, we're going to switch gears here to the periodic menu. And the very first thing we're gonna talk about is this appropriation resolution report. And um, if we click here, so this, um, it, you're basically just generating a report and um, it's fairly straightforward as far as um, these options here. Um, this is one that I'm gonna hop back over to the wiki <laughs> and uh, let's go to our periodic uh, menu. So, and, and this is really nice here because it gives you like, if you are familiar with classic, these are um, the comparisons or like your district, you know, um, came from classic and they're trying to figure out um, what's their comparative report. So this one was the app res in classic and it allows the user to generate a report of the district's temporary resolution prior to the fiscal year closing or as a final resolution. Um, so let's click on here. And this just gives us a little bit um, more information about these options, but we'll we'll take a look at them. Um, but what I do want to note is that when they're running this, there is like a narrative. Uh, there's narrative data for that that um, that they usually want, and that is in the wiki. So we provided a sample of that that they can use um, if that's something they're looking for. So I know we've had that asked for. We made sure that it was a note so that you could see it here. But if that's something that they ask you for, uh, that's in the wiki. All right. Um, so once I'm in here, I can select the fiscal year and then amounts to use. This is what's going to dictate the columns that appear on this report. So if I choose beginning balance only, it's gonna give me, um, it's gonna break down my accounts and it's going to give me the beginning balances. Next year proposed. So um, this is also one that I have noted because this one it's like can be a little bit confusing is if I want um, what I have in that proposed amounts grid for 2023, um, for those 2023, uh, budgets. Right now, that's the next year proposed. So if I'm in 22, then it's for next year. So the fiscal year is 22, and I choose next year proposed, it'll be the 23 budgets. Um, so that's how that works. And then we have um, these options where I have the fiscal to date appropriation, carryover in totals, um, or the appropriation minus the carryover encumbrances. So if I click this, uh, let's just take a look, um, include accounts with zero balances, that it automatically does not include those. And then um, there's a recap. I'm gonna go ahead and let's generate this. So here's what this looks like. I have um, my general fund and then it breaks it down um, here. The total appropriated, the carryover and the appropriations. And so, you know, give you that information for all of your accounts. Um, what I wanna talk about, so there is a way to designate um, 
which funds are included and also what this breakdown is per each fund. Um, so that works a little bit different as far as like where you're, you are setting that up for this report. So I want to show that as well. So let's go back here. So this is where we have um, our account grid open. So this is good because this is where we need to be. So I'm just core accounts. And on the fund, if I go look at this fund, I could edit here. There's this checkbox right here that says include in resolution. So this checkbox is saying that I want to include it on this appropriation resolution report. So this is why it's included. If I uncheck this, I will no longer have the 001 when I run that report. I also have resolution levels. So fund, fund special cost center, function one digit, two digit, and object one digit. So let's hop back over here. Fund, oops, fund special cost center, um, function one digit, function two digit, and object one digit. So each one of those um, are specifically designated by this setup. That's why we're seeing that level of detail. Some districts might just want like just the fund special cost center, or you know maybe they don't need it all the way down to object one digit. So if you um, update these on the fund uh, setup, then then that is the way to change that. The other thing that um, I've seen sometimes is um, for these reports, and we have a couple of them here. Um, there is also a fund type. Let's go to the cash. Um, so when you have this cash account, if you look at this, uh, right here, this fund type is um, set up for like general fund, um, special revenue, debt services, permanent funds. So um, when, you, when you're creating a fund or when they're creating like um, an additional one, so obviously we're looking at the 001, this one's always here, but if they're adding, you know, another fund with a special cost center, then um, they wanna make sure this is populated. I'm second guessing now if it's actually the appropriation resolution report or a different one that uses this fund type, but um, if this is not populated, there are some reports that it won't show up on. And um, the trick is kind of double checking this. So um, since we're looking at <laughs> looking at these fun setups, I figured that um, I would mention that as well. Um, okay, so let's see. Let's head next to, um, we're just gonna go ahead and skip to the certification reports here. And this one has a bit more on the configuration options. Um, when you're in here, you can select the report and there are really two types of reports. Uh, well, there's four options, but it's mostly two types of reports here. So um, you have the certificate of available balances and you can get that in uh, detail or summary. And then you have the amended certificate of estimated resources. So um, my understanding is that the certificate of available balances they would use at the beginning of the fiscal year. Um, and this is something they submit to their county auditors. And then if something changes, they would run the amended certificate of estimated resources and submit that. Let's go ahead with the, um, the first one here, the certificate of available balances. I'm gonna run it in detail. Um, and then we have all of these options. So I'm gonna kind of just briefly talk about, you know, how you'd use these is um, exclude a fund special cost center. So if I wanted something not to show on the report, there's a certain fund I wanna leave out. Um, I click this plus and I would enter, enter that. If I didn't want it to actually be in the parameters, I, I messed up, um, I would just exit out of there. And all of these boxes kind of work like that. Uh, the principal amounts for permanent funds. So this one's I have some notes on. Um, 
So again, you would enter the fund and special cost center. Uh, and then um, this one, yeah, it's also gonna give you a principal amount that you would enter. Um, so rep reporting requirements state that only interest earnings are supposed to be considered available for expenditure um, when certifying and year balances of a permanent fund. So basically um, with that note, this is allowing them to um, enter those amounts so that they can be accounted for appropriately. And you know what, while I'm at this, let's go switch here. Let's go to our documentation. Let's go to the wiki. Oh gosh. Okay, let's go back here. Periodic certification reports. So we are talking about this one. And so here's what I'm looking at here. Um, I have this in my notes. So this is available to you too. So um, basically, and, and again, like, you know, I know we're on a beginner training, so I want to talk about these things. So they're in your mind, but um, also like, don't want to overload you. So um, if this is something that you get questions on from a district, you know, you have this reference, like we can certainly talk about it more. Um, so keep that in mind too. <laughs> Um, and then we have the um, advances not repaid. So this we're going to actually see for this one that there is a specific column um, on the report that that anything you enter into this will go on. Um, and this one has a tool tip as well. Oh, yeah. And so does this one. So we have some helpful, helpful tips on here um, as they're entering as well that they can pop up and see. Uh, but let's go ahead and get rid of this okay because i want to look at this report this report is um very interesting as far as the columns that it has on it and again there are notes uh i'm not i'm gonna we're gonna talk through these but um just know these report column calculations are listed in the wiki if you need to refer back um but what we're looking at here so okay so we have um the general fund, the special revenue. Ah, I'm pretty sure this is the one that you need the fund type to find. If you don't see something on this report that should be, check that fund type on the cash account that, that we looked at. That's which one it is. Um, okay, so cash balance as of June 30th. So this is your cash balance from the prior year. So whichever you know fiscal year I'm running this for, I have my reporting period up here. That's gonna be cash balance June 30th. If I went and ran a cash summary report as of June 30th for the prior year, that's where this column's coming from. Same thing with the encumbrances. So those are just system figures. Advance is not repaid. This is what you entered when you, ent when you um, generated the report. That specific box that we had for advance is not repaid. Um, that's going to populate this column if they have them. Okay, so then this column here, carryover balance available for appropriation. What this is going to be is a calculation, and I'm going to make sure I get this right. So it's column one, so it's the cash balance, minus the encumbrances, plus any advances not repaid. So in this case, all of these are zero, so it's basically... First column minus second column equals um, the balance that's available to appropriate. Excuse me. Um, and then let's see. So total amount um, from all sources available for expenditures. So this is another one you want to know. Um, one thing I wanted to say about this report is my understanding is that, um, you know, and, and maybe it was even just like a classic thing. I'm not sure. But um, we had this report available. This was cert bow, but um, I don't believe that all districts used the actual system report. Like this is something that maybe they could have like generated a copy themselves. Like they might have, you know, used spreadsheets to like pull all these figures in um, and then make this themselves. So why that's relevant is this column right here pulls from your receivable amounts. So we were looking at budgeting. You have those like anticipated revenues. They would enter those in at the beginning of the year. And that's what's like receivable. So um, not the actual received, it's their estimate. Um, from what I know, especially if they weren't using a report like this directly from the system in classic, they might not have normally entered those. Like some districts just 
don't don't enter those and they keep track of those separately. So I have had a reported before um, or like had questions on this report where they're like, wow, this column's blank. You know, why don't I have anything in there? And the key is that maybe they weren't used to uh, entering receivable amounts. But um, if they do want to enter receivable amounts and use this report going forward, you know, now that we have this nice version from the redesign, maybe that's something that they'll start using. So, yeah, so this is receivable um, as defined on the um, accounts. Um, let's see. Yes, if the district did not enter temporary or permanent appropriations, then this will be zero. So, and that is, that would be noted in the section we looked at on the um, wiki as well. All right, so last column then, this is another calculation. So this is columns four plus column five. So um, this was our calculated from these two. This is our um, carryover balance available. And then this was our receivable. Um, figures that were available, add those together, and um, that is our last column, so our total amount available. All right. All righty. Um, let's see. So then we do also have the amended certificate. Let's take a look at this one. Again, you know, these options all do work um, similar to um, what we saw before. Okay, um, so you have your unencumbered balance, and um, so this is the July 1 cash balance minus the prior year encumbrance plus advances not repaid um, minus the principal entered. So this one is also a calculation, um, and then you have taxes, which um, taxes and other sources are the receivable amounts. Um, so, oh, other, I'm sorry, other sources. So these are these are things that they've entered in the system. And then the total is the calculation column, um, all of the columns added together. And I'm sure you're noticing that I'm referencing my notes on like which, you know, what's what's the which which columns are adding to which. Um, and these, you know, they're uh, it's interesting because, um, you know, when it comes up, Oh, I do, definitely don't remember them all offhand, but I certainly go to the wiki to see what the calculation is, because especially if there's something that, you know, they're not sure where it's coming from, or it seems like it's off, knowing what is going into those totals is so, so helpful. All right. All righty. I think we're good on that. So let's keep going here. Um, what do I have next on my list? Oh, next on my list is the cash reconciliation. So the cash reconciliation in redesign is great. Um, it's it's really nice. We had a program that did this in Classic, but it was like, it was not as smooth um, <laughs> as, as what this is. So again, this is one that they may or may not have used in the system, but you know, if you have a district that maybe didn't use this in here before, they might wanna start. Uh, so it is required to enter this at fiscal year end. So we'll mention it as part of the fiscal year end um, checklist, but uh, they can't actually do it every month. So uh, I have February created out here and I do have an option if I view this where I could just clone this month to month. And um, what we'll see is that it has these different sections where they would enter their amounts and help them um, sort of balance out. And so a lot of these things might not change, like where they have their money in banks or like what their petty cash is, like those might be things where at least the description is the same and then they just update the amounts. So cloning this might be super convenient. Um, and when I do that, I would just select, okay, boom, let's do March. And I could come in here and update my figures. And I said that one stayed the same. Adjustment. Okay, maybe we need another adjustment. We'll add that. 
And so they can kind of come through here and just, yeah, adding is as simple as entering the description and the amount and then clicking add, they can add. Um, there are limits on here. Um, since this is something that at the fiscal year end, so the June version will get submitted with the EMIS info, the limits are kind of um, set so that it's consistent with, with what they want there. Um, but there is, I think there's an other section somewhere. Oh, here we go. We have like, uh, that's the clearance amounts. Oh, here, like some of these are, are limited in 99. So they have some, some more flexibility with some. Um, and then the other thing that I want to point out. So it's um, as I enter figures here, it's keeping track. And ultimately what this does is the total fund balance right here. So I told this when I very first started, oops, sorry for the scroll. I told it the posting period that I want to link this to is March, 2022. So what that told it is it said, okay, what's the balance? So if I ran a cash summary as of March, 2022, what's the fund balance that would show on that? And it's taking that figure and putting that here so that when I add all of these things up, my total entered amount should balance to this. And once they get that all set, so I can save this now, even though I don't balance. Um, like I could go through and make a balance, but since I'm entering just random figures, it'll give me a warning and say, hey, this doesn't balance, which, you know, as they're working things out, they might need to go investigate. So they'll save this up and then they'll come back and figure out where they need to um, enter an adjustment or if there's something that's off. Um, but once I have this all set, I can also do print to file. And gosh, this is so nice. So um, when I open this up, let's open this. I have my cash reconciliation as of March, 2022, and it's got a timestamp when I ran this. It has all of the figures that I entered here, my total balance, my total fund balance, and then I have a signature line for the treasurer. And so this might be something that they use to communicate with their board. Um, so that just prints, um, prints like a really nice version for them there. Uh, let's see. Okay. Um, and then, yeah, and then they'll have these. So if they do decide to do them every month, or maybe they just do them every fiscal year, you know, if they just do them every fiscal year, like that's fine too. But, um, you know, as they create them, then they'll sit out here. So if they needed to go back and look at those figures, they could. Um, okay, five-year forecast is where we're hopping to next. So again, you know, periodic, this things that happen to certain times of year. Um, so this one is um, usually they do it in the spring and the fall. Um, so you do the fall and then I, I think it's a spring update. Um, so what this first page that we're going to see, this gives me basically um, all of the forecast line numbers. This gives me the accounts and amounts. And I have a grid view if I wanted to look at it here. I could generate a file as a CSV and pull all of these um, figures that way. Um, it would just be like a, a data version. Or what's really nice is generating it to Excel. And I think this takes a minute. So let's do this. Let's say open when done. Um, but this is going to generate it to write to an Excel spreadsheet for us. Um, so while we're waiting for that to generate, we have, so all of these lines, um, you can view them on the actual account code too. If you were to go look at these accounts, um, it does link on there. Um, the line number that it's linked to is based on, um, in the EMIS manual, they have uh, certain you know account codes. So the dimensions basically um, link to specific forecast line numbers and for redesign we really reviewed that and you know made sure that it's you know if this is what it says you know this receipt code should be then this is what line number 
um, it'll link to. So if you ever have any questions on that, my place, my go-to place is to look at the ODE EMIS manual. And that is very helpful when it comes to uh, the line numbers. Oop, okay. Enable editing. We got a lot going on here. Okay, hang on. There we go. All right. So when we generate to Excel, this is what we see. Let me just make this big. Um, let's make sure to enable the content here. And what I have, so I do have this data tab, and this is just like my plain figures. But then um, if I come in here, I can see that that populated, this is actually the um, like five-year forecast sheet. So um, all of these figures uh, do come in here. And uh, here's the forecast. And so these figures populate with the um, figures from your system. So this can be very helpful. Save that. Okay, we're hopping right through. Next, let's go to the spending plan page. Um, so this the spending plan is sort of the um, equivalent to classics like. Uh, SM, it was SM1, SM2, the SM reports. And so this also relates to um, five-year forecast figures and I'm getting reports for that. We do have several spending plan related reports. Well, several, I we have like three, I think, um, in redesign. And so what this page is actually for is there was a page um, in Classic that allowed you to enter estimates. So, you know, whether you use that one or maybe even if it wasn't used in Classic, you know, you're just, just using this in redesign. Um, if you used it in Classic, it doesn't come over. So either way, we're kind of in the same boat. Um, so what you are creating here, if you click create, is this is how you enter estimated figures. So some of those reports say, here's what's estimated, here's where the actual is, and that can be used to kind of keep tabs on, um, spending in different accounts. Well, this is where the estimated figures would get entered. So if I have uh, my line number and, um, you know, and, and I guess I'm saying spending, but also received, right? So uh, I would want to use, let's just pick the first one. So if I have this line number, then uh, July, okay, I'm estimating 600. And as I go through and add these, this will get my um, this will update my fiscal year estimate as well. So I'm just entering random numbers here, and I'm just tabbing through these. So these are pretty um, pretty easy to enter. And um, so this is what fiscal year it's for, what line number, and then I could actually do like a create new if I wanted to um, save that. And oh, and then it pops me up the next one. So if I wanted to go through and add each line, I could just kind of like go through, add them, and then they'll um, save per line number in this grid. Let's see. Okay, we're rolling right through. Um, just check. Oh no, it's not on that one. Hang on, just a minute. Uh, I think we'll just keep going. Um, I was gonna double check. I think we'll we'll do our break there at like ten fifteen or ten thirty. Um, for now, though, we have we have a couple more things that we can do since we're only at 10. We're, we're doing good. Um, all right. So next, we're going to talk about these, uh, the fiscal year end options. And um, these, again, something that we are going to talk about um, as part of our fiscal year end um, meeting. We go, we go through, we'll do, you know, a training like this um, where you can log in and 
we'll go through you know what needs done here but as far as the actual pages you're using they are on this periodic menu uh the first one that i'm going to talk about these kind of go hand in hand the federal assistance so the summary is what you're going to do first and the fiscal uh, i'm sorry <laughs> the federal assistance summary is basically what just sets up like which year is this for so fiscal year end 2022 i could add a comment if i want i have this assistance over threshold option um but basically i just want to save that up and so federal assistance um this is going to be figures that they're entering that um, they need to report for emis at their fiscal year end so um the the districts will need to enter this but you know they'll um know like which figures that they would need to enter uh so um so again this is just the year on the summary when i go to the detail this is where i can actually enter the additional information so um federal assistance summary this is why i had to enter that first because i need to have this 22 in the drop down if i'm entering like multiple of these detail records to 22 then i have a line number so those will increment um, the CFDA, so this is a code, um, and then if you kind of hover over this, you get a tooltip, and there is a website that they can go to um, to look up the CFDA numbers. Um, they can search for those. I'm just going to put, put one in here um, that I know is in the right format. The grant title. So um, again, this is something that they can go, there's a website that they can go to look for the grant titles. And then cash account. So here's where they can select um, a cash account. I shouldn't scroll, I should do this. And uh, so if I just go ahead and pick one of these, and then um, I can tab through when I tab if it had um, if it had expenditures those actually when I select this, um, I believe those will populate. Um, or I can just enter in here what the figures um, should be. And then um, I could just go ahead save that. And then you could do that create new option, you can create, um, but just basically any records that they need to report for that year, that's how they're gonna enter them in the screen. Uh, similarly, the civil proceedings, again, another one that they would enter at fiscal year end. This is something that's going to get, uh, get reported with their year end, like EMIS reporting. Um, and so just create we're going to enter the fiscal year and then this is where they would start getting um like they would have this information so the, the proceeding number court case number um you know and they would enter the expenses associated with that and they can enter like additional participants if they need to um, but this is all information that like they'll have that they know that they need to report this is how they enter it in and then you'd save that up and um, any of those would appear in the grid. Now, it is tied with the fiscal year. So like these will stay out here the next year, it'll be there for them to reference if they need to enter it again, if it's something that's spanning multiple years. So that's kind of nice that it'll, um, you know, kind of stay out here associated with, with this year for reference. All right. Next is building profiles. So this, um, this one, when they um, enter this in, so what they'll do, left digits. is they'll want to create a line for each of their buildings, and then they're going to put in the square footage and the transportation and lunchroom percentages. And so I'm just gonna save this so we can see it in the grid. Um, and let's create another one here. And usually you would definitely um, probably see your districts with more than just two lines and more than 50, 50, but it depends, you know, if it's some of them, um, it's like a ESC, they might not, but um, 
but basically what this is what this is allowing them to enter here is transportation percentage so what's the split of transportation or lunchroom over their buildings and whatever these percentages are on all of their records it should equal up to a hundred percent um this again reported with their emis um financials for fiscal year end it kind of helps uh, my understanding is it you know it helps them like um for expenses that are like to the district IRN like that kind of helps with understanding what the split is for the district as far as like um using those percentages for estimates um but yeah so they have to they have to report that information and it has to be equal to a hundred a hundred percent for each um, percentage column Now, this one you'll notice is not tied to a specific year, like the other ones we talked about for fiscal year end. Uh, this will stay out here. So, um, and this is something that I think we've even, you know, suggested they could look at when they first um, switch over, uh, make sure this is right. But generally, in our fiscal year end um, checklist discussion, we suggest they review these every year and update them as needed. Um, however, from year to year, they might not change. You know, they might look at these and they might be exactly the same as last year. If nothing's changed with their schools, you know, the square footage might be the same. Um, you know, they haven't changed up anything in transportation. So it very well could be that these, that they enter these and these stay the same for a while uh, and that's okay. Um, let's see. Okay, I think we are doing pretty good here. Um, so now we just have, so that's all the fiscal year end items. Uh, let's talk about the 1099 extracts. This is a calendar year end um, item. So we did talk about this in um, our uh, calendar year end that we had in November. Again, we'll do that every year. So, um, you know, this year in November, we will do a calendar year end checklist review and we'll talk about using this 1099 extract page. Um, but uh, what it's gonna do, so payment year, so I don't have December in this database yet. So it needs to have December of like the year uh, to default to be able to like run it for that year. So this is still, uh, would let me like run it back for 2021. I have my types of 1099 forms. Uh, it gives me different output file options. And then, um, you know, this is just kind of like my specifics for actually generating either um, a 1099 uh, report for the extra, like of what I would extract, or um, actually generating, you know, an extract file that could be submitted. Uh, we do have options where uh, districts could run their own submission file. So um, that is, there's some setup involved in that, but that is an option that we have at this point. Um, or, you know, ITCs can still generate and print um, and submit on behalf of the districts. So either of those um, are options that you can take uh, using this page. And um, we do have scheduled, um, we, we do have uh, plans to um, have this so that eventually you can even um, print the forms, get the file to print the forms right from here. Um, so that's exciting. So we look forward to that. All right, so we're doing pretty good. Um, I'll tell you what I'm going to I'm going to keep going for just right now. We have these extracts to go through, but these extracts, there's not a lot to them. Like, I think we can kind of knock these out and just talk through them. Um, and then we'll take a break after that before we hop into the system menu, because the system menu is the exciting part of today. So um, I can't wait to show that to you. So um, let's go ahead and just hop over here. We've been talking about all of these pages that um, that you have for fiscal year end. And I keep saying, yes, those are gonna get reported for EMIS reporting. So at the end of the year, it, um, how it works with the EMIS reporting is most of the stuff is pulled directly from the system. Um, 
with the Sith, uh, with, with the Sith poll. Um, and that's going to be like the actual figures on the accounts and that sort of thing. But this extract is for the supplemental information. So um, some of that additional stuff that is entered, there's like a separate file that generates with this extract that um, they would use this, they generate the file, and then they load that into the data collector so that it can be used in combination with the information that's pulled through SIF. Um, again, we talk about this in the fiscal year end webinar. So this is, you know, this is where we're going to refer you to, and then, you know, you'll be able to um, use this to, to pull that info. And when we go through these extracts, these extract files are not pretty, like they're just data files. So I'm not actually going to run them. The gap extract. So um, this one is, um, again, very simple. Uh, so if we said, all right, for 2023, or if I wanted to pick like a previous fiscal year and submit, this is going to generate my extract file with all of the gap info that can be used to um, import to WebGap to view information there. Um, yeah, and that's all the notes I have about this one. It's very straightforward. OhioCheckbook.gov. So not everyone uses this one. This is just specifically, you know, if there are districts that um, submit information to OhioCheckbook.gov. And um, there they usually, um, so they'll, they'll submit so that they can, it's basically for transparency. So um, they would, you know, submit and it would show, you know, here's what they've, they've paid, here's things that they've, um, uh, here's like a record of their spending, basically. I think it actually shows the detail of like their checks. It's a, it's a copy of their checkbook, <laughs> so to say. Um, but in order to get that information, they can do this extract from USAS because obviously they're creating all of their checks and disbursements here. Um, they might submit this on like a quarterly basis or a monthly basis. Uh, I think it's, it, I think it might be up to them as far as how often they submit it. Um, so that's why we have this like start end date range. So say they do this monthly, they come in here, they said, okay, I want everything for March. They have the option to exclude certain cash accounts. So maybe there's something that they don't put out there. Like if it's got to do, like maybe they, um, you know, have a special cost center, you know, have like a certain grant account that they're not going to um, have available for public viewing. And so they could exclude cash accounts. And um, then they have two options here. So they can either generate this to a CSV file. And I do believe there's a way that they can upload it if they get the CSV file. Uh, so if they want to do that, they can. Um, but generate and submit will actually send this right to OhioCheckbook.gov. And we've worked with them um, as far as like updating this page and this uh, submission. So uh, they could just generate and submit and they get a little confirmation saying it's been sent. And then the last one on here is positive pay. So uh, positive pay, so this is um, basically they've um, created checks and then what they want to do is they want to create an extract showing that check information um, as something that they send to their bank. And then the bank uses that to compare the checks that are cashed and that's kind of like a fraud prevention measure. So um, if districts are using this through their bank, they are looking for a way to get that information uh, from the system. And this page gives them a handy little way to do it. They have an option to use CSV or fixed format, which is like kind of has like tabs or spaces in it. Um, if the file looks like that. Um, CSV is it has commas. Um, and, and what I can do here, so I can just like add more um extract fields and each one of these is going to be like a column so bank account number then maybe let's say like the check number the payee or like the vendor um the check date and the amount 
Now, I'm totally picking randomly from this list to give you guys an example. But what I would do if I was setting this up for a district is I would like either the bank would have some kind of like format um like documentation like they would say this is the format that we need um or even if you have like a file even if you have like the file that they use and you can look at that um you can kind of like figure it out from there but what i want my goal with these is to actually um set this up as to what the bank requires these this field order is for how they read the positive pay files. So if I look at their, um, you know, the document they provide the district and they say, okay, I actually need the check number to be, you know, the last thing on, uh, in the order of columns, then I would change this and I would have it set up like this instead. So um, that's what you're doing on this page. And that's why it has the flexibility to choose, you know, which thing you want where, um, the length of characters, and then this format. So the format is, um, it's, you know, it's, it's a little programmery, <laughs> um, but this is basically like a standard format um, that can be used. So uh, let me go back to our documentation. I think we found some, I'm pretty sure we added some notes here to try and help you out with this. Uh, Cause they might tell you like, yeah, it should be um, in this like specific format, but we found this and uh, we found like a quick reference here and added it um, to try and help you if there's something that, you know, that you need to change, but it does default. Uh, you know, we have it default to like a standard um, format that it should be in all the ones that, you know, I mean, I guess it's been a while since I've actually set set one up um, for a district, but I, I don't know that I've had to change that the majority of time. So hopefully you can just leave those. But if it is something that needs to be tweaked, that gives you, you know, at least you have access to, to update if needed. Um, okay, so starting date, this is like, what's the date that I want to pull as a kind of like, what's the, the late, the earliest date that I want checks to be from. So say I pull this monthly and, um, or like since my last check run, and um, if I had already submitted a positive pay file for all of the checks in February, now I need to submit a positive pay file for all the checks that I've cut in March, I would have March one and it would give me checks from March 1 and anything after that. The bank account, so this um, can be used with this bank account number, but um, also the checks. So um, if you remember uh, yesterday, Pat had pointed out, you know, the bank account um, was on some of the pages that she showed and a bank account, a specific bank account is associated with disbursements. So I wanna pull this for this is gonna be the disbursements that are connected to this default bank or to this bank. Um, doesn't have to be the default. You could pick the other one too. Um, but whichever bank account I choose here, that's gonna correspond to which disbursements I get. Um, most districts I've seen are using one bank, but you know, if they're if they are using two and tying disbursements to two different banks, then you, they might run this twice, you know, they, and they might have you know different setup for each or something. Uh, but then you would just generate this and um, it would pop up, you know, a CSV or a fixed file based on what you chose. I don't know if this is going to populate anything. I have disbursements out there. Oh, I do. See? So it gave us the bank account number, the um, payee name, the check date, amount, and check number. Right. Okay, so that covers extracts. So we got budgeting, periodic, and extracts knocked out. Um, again, like some of this stuff, like we probably could go deeper into, but keeping this a beginner training is something that, you know, I, I don't, I want to um, kind of give you like why, like what would, what would these things be used for? And, um, when we get into system menu, I'm, I'm kind of glad that's where we get to spend most of our time because I think that's stuff that you're really going to like seeing. Um, but again, I, I believe we do go into more of that 
two even in our intermediate training. So, uh, so that said, let's take a break. It is 1020 now. Um, I'm going to pick back up at 1030 and then we'll go through um, everything on that system menu and uh, round out the day. So um, I'll be back. Okay, so we're back from break. So I'm gonna go ahead and continue here. We're talking about the system menu. Um, if you are following along in the PowerPoint, we have made it to slide 58. So we're doing pretty good. So this is like, like right now, this is our halfway point of our like full beginner training, um, you know, the starting yesterday and continuing tomorrow. So um, let's go to the system menu and most of the things on this menu that we're going to talk about um, are really like administrator or higher level access. So, um, you know, a lot of users within the system like may not even see this. Uh, we're going to start with configuration. And this is something that only admin users have access to by default. Um, there are a couple on here that like higher level, like USAS manager may be, be, may be able to see. Um, but mostly these are things at the ITC that you are going to be um, just accessing. So um, configuration, this is going to allow you to update configure option, configuration options for uh, different functions within the system, different modules that are installed. Um, and there's really a variety of things on here. This is um, definitely one that we go into in more detail on other trainings, but I just want to highlight some of the ones um, in here. Um, let's see. So um, as we're going through, see like accounts receivable, you see that one's like a specific one. If they use accounts receivable then and they don't have that module installed, then you won't see that on here. Um, this application configuration. So this one basically designates what type of um, instance you're in. So in any normal live instance, this is what it would look like production, um, external notification and jobs can they run. Uh, if you pull a backup instance, like say you pull a test instance, then that would be um, marked to support and then these two would not be checked and that's kind of like a default thing that happens when you pull a support instance to make sure that like say they have jobs that are set to send emails to their staff, like if you pull a test instance and do something that would trigger that like you don't want that to be sending to that district staff. So this configuration um, getting automatically set for test instances is what you know um, prevents that from happening. So, uh, so that's what that's for. Um, authentication and password requirements. So we are going to be looking at the user setup later today. And uh, this is uh, where you can configure for a district, like how long when I reset a password, how long, uh, does it stay good for before it expires? And then password complexity. So this is for users that log in to this instance for this district, like, you know, does it need to have um, an uppercase letter? Uh, how long does it have to be? And so that sort of stuff can be um, configured here. Uh, let's look at, okay, oh, we were talking a lot about fiscal year end options. So I mentioned with that EMIS extract that that's kind of like a supplemental um, bit of information, but the core of information pulls directly from the software um, that uses the SOAP service and that configuration can be found here. So um, what I would do is I would put in the fiscal year and actually let's do 23. So if I save this, so now whenever the data collector goes to, um, and there's some background configuration that's set up to connect those actually, but once they're connected, this is what tells it what year to pull from. Um, and the reason this is important is because this way, it's gonna tell it to pull 2023. If they get to July, they switch over to 2020, um, to actually, you know what? I'm sorry, I want to set this to 2022, getting a year ahead. Oopsies, 
So we're in 20, we're going to be closing 2022. So we want it to pull 2022. And then when we switch over to 2023, um, maybe they haven't finished their financial reporting yet. So they can move on with their actual period. They can move on with their processing and their system. And this would tell the data collector, hey, they're still submitting for 2022. So if you pull, I need you to still pull that prior year. So um, this configuration is really big for that. Email configuration. Um, so here's the other thing, when they're first coming in to redesign, whether it's from classic or, um, you know, if they're starting up or maybe they didn't send things through email and, you know, before, and now they want to, um, there is a module for email notifications that needs to be turned on. And then once that is turned on, this configuration uh, would be where you would set up like, uh, so the SMTP host and the port is something that you may get from like your, um, your tech team. You know, sometimes I've seen this, sometimes the host is a specific name, sometimes it's an IP address, and then the default um, from address and administrator address, these would normally be email addresses. So this is like what email is, um, is it going to look like it's sending from? And um, so say, you know, say, and again, we'll look at reports tomorrow, but say we set something up to have a report email to somebody at the district um, and you want to change like where, uh, where, what the email is coming from. And, and also like for your existing districts, if they have it configured to come from their treasurer, from their treasurer's email, but then they get a new treasurer, like you might need to come into this configuration to change that for them because they don't want the old treasurer to show on there anymore. Uh, so this would be like, uh, the other thing to note here that I've just found in my experience is the email address might also need to have like access to send through this SMTP host. And um, so some of the hosts, like, um, again, this is something I would totally work with the tech department for, um, but some of them have like certain um, security prevention measures where not just any email address can be like a from email uh, to send through their host. So, you know, that, that might be a consideration for what email uh, is being used there as well. Um, the other thing to note here is right now, so we have this default administrator address and default from address. Uh, right now, for what the email, um, for like what this is used for, these fields are essentially the same. You could put the same one in. Um, really, the default from address is what's used right now. Um, we added the other field, you know, my understanding is like if there's something that we need to use it for in the future, but at this point, I don't think it's actually being used to send anywhere. So um, really the default from address is the big one you need to, um, that's, that's the one you're gonna use. Uh, let's see. Um, the IRS Form 1099 submission configuration. So when we just looked at that page, um, I mentioned that there is a way that you can say the district will submit the file. So if this is checked, this is where they'd fill in, uh, this is where they or you would fill in the information um, depending on the access levels. Um, or if they are not gonna be submitting, you would uncheck this and save. And um, then, it, then that page will be set up so that um, it would, you know, not have the separate information from like a district submitter. And then let's talk about uh, the transaction configuration. So this is interesting. And um, again, this is one that we, we do have this kind of written out in the documentation page for configuration under that transaction configuration section. I would recommend reading through that example, but I'm gonna give you one too. Um, Cause this does work differently than like just how the highest check number would work um, in the classic system. And um, it's just a way, once you, once you kind of wrap your mind around it, I think it makes sense, but I know that it's different. So, so let's look at it. So um, 
check number and these all just default like i'm in a test instance this would just be like if it was blank like it just defaults to like the highest number possible um but oh actually you know what let's let's go in our second tab so if i come over to my disbursements and i look at my check numbers so here's what i would do is i would kind of like filter this i would um do this so that i have let's say my highest ones Okay, so if my highest number is this and my configuration is 9999, um, what it's going to do is it's going to look for the next lowest number below whatever is configured here. So the next lowest number below the highest number that exists is going to be 889862. So uh, let's see, I need one without a check number. And then, hmm, my, but my highest number on file is two. We might need to change this. So um, let's let's do a different one here. So let's let's do one that's like lower. So whatever I configure, it's going to be the next one below that. So if I say this check number is one zero six four three. Um, if I enter this, then the next lowest would be like in this series, the 9775. So 10643, let's go enter that. Let's save that. I'm going to do a little refresh here. And. Oh. You know what? It's the bank. We need we need a different check. So so remember when we were we were talking about with the positive pay disbursements are tied to bank accounts. So if I look at uh, let's go back. Let's figure out which bank we need. Um. So this one. Let's look at this one. Sorry, cool computers here. So this check is what well, says Huntington. Which I think account name vendor. Maybe it's oh bank account number one. Okay, so this is tied to the Huntington bank account, but I think, but the reason that these check numbers are different is because this one is using fifth third. So we're going a little off the rails, but I want to show you how this works. So. A little, re little review from yesterday. <laughs> uh, no. Oh my gosh, I'm clicking all the wrong things. <laughs> this is what I get for going off the rails. Uh, let's see, let's see. Uh, we just need a random one. Okay, so let me go ahead, take this. Let's post it. Um, so this is where we, we assign, so each, each um, when you post the invoice, it's um, going to be associated with um, a certain bank account um, for the disbursement. So let's post this one. This does show, though, you know, especially like in with these like check number assigns, you know, with this transaction configuration, like it is relevant, you know, if they do have multiple banks, um, basically it's going to allow them to have like a series for each. Um, so because these must be the only two checks on file for this other bank, then the, even though that number was like 9999, it says, what's the next highest? Well, the next highest was still only, you know, two. <laughs> um, okay. So here's this. So now let's go ahead, generate this print file. There we go. 9775. And that was because when I looked, I put the next highest number that existed for this bank account above 9775 and that's what's in my configuration so let's go ahead we'll generate i would just generate this. and of course you do have that box where you can like manually type in the check number like the starting number for whatever check run too so if you want to use that this is just like your auto assign option um so i'm sure you know there might be some different options that districts would use if they are in a situation with two bank accounts um but but yeah so if we look so now 
let's go do our little sort. So because we had this next highest now, because we still have this number 10643, the next time we assign a check, it's going to say, oh, 9776. So the next one is 977. So whatever that gap is, is what it's filling. And, you know, that's where you do have to watch because once I get to this check number, if I want to keep advancing beyond that, I might have to go change that transaction configuration to 15828 so that it'll continue assigning from here. Um, and, and so that works the same uh, with this transaction configuration with any of these um, different. So PO numbers, same thing. Receipt numbers, same thing. And again, um, there is an example that, that goes through that in um, the documentation as well. So if you have any questions on that one, um, check there or let us know. Okay. Um, so I think that's all I'm going to cover in configuration for now. Um, you know, I know there's a lot of these here and I'm, I'm not wanting to specifically um, skip them, but some of them are very interesting. So I think those are the main ones that you need to know about for now. Um, okay, system. So next, let's talk about custom field definitions. Now, this is another one. We are like scratching the surface. Like this is, this is a page that I want you to know is here. I'm gonna give you an example of it. But honestly, even this, like I feel like there are totally more ways that this can be used. You know, this might not be something that you're diving into right away, but down the line, like I want you to know this is here because I think that there can be situations where this can really help with the solution. Um, this is a way that districts can kind of like customize uh, any, maybe not any, most pages. We'll say most pages. So what's happening here is um, this is a way that um, you can add another field or you can modify certain fields on um, different pages throughout the software. So what we're gonna look at, I'm gonna hop over here. Let's look at the page that we're gonna modify. So I'm gonna go to vendors. And we're going to look at, I guess, let's just look at Lacey here. Um, so let me make sure I didn't already add it. No, we're, uh, we're good. We're good. So um, what we have here, so this is our, our vendor page that we looked at. We have our amounts. We have our 1099 information. Um, new hire, we have these standard custom fields. So just like the basics to start is these standard custom fields. See, we have like category, code one, code two. If they had information in their, they had like standard fields that were in classic and those might've come over here. But like there, it was called, you know, something like code one or code two. If that means something to this district, if they said like, oh, we always use code one for this specific topic or like item, they could change this header right here to actually say what the thing is. And, and so like, that's just a way that, you know, it's like a convenience that could help them. So let's go to, okay, here's our little vendor block here. So look, here's where we have this uh, code one, so let's go ahead, let's do this. Let's say code one. Now, and this is just editing an existing field. So display name for code one, let's say code one is, you know, um, gosh, I probably should have come up with an example, but we're just gonna give them like a color. Um, so let's change this. This is the color. Now here's the other thing. I mean, they can keep this where they can just like type in a field. But because this is a code, they could also say like, all right, blue, maybe, and maybe like we're, oops, sorry. Um, we're just doing like rent, colors kind of like a random thing that I picked, but you know, maybe this is like their organization. Um, maybe this is how they like organize their vendors in the folder. So if they wanted to look at this vendor, they wanted to go, you know, correspond to their color coding. So. Okay, so I'm updating that existing field with this. Let me go ahead and just save that. I'm gonna come here, I'm gonna do a little refresh. And let's look at Lacey. 
So now look at this field is called color. And if I were to edit this, um, oh darn, I think I forgot a step. Um, hmm. Well, I can type in the color here. There is a way, I might have to do it when I created the field. There is a way that you can make these a drop down. Um, and so again, that's probably where we, we need to go to the wiki and double check how to do that. But at, at the very least, I can update this header and then save it there. Um, so then I'd be able to pull that on reports to organize, um, you know, or see that on the record. So that's updating an existing field. But if I go to create, I can also add a field. Um, the types, so like the type is kind of like, all right, you know, it's a code. Oh, now I gotta try this. Um, excuse me, applies to the vendor. Hmm. There must be a trick that I'm forgetting. But let's go, let's go with the example that I actually had planned here. I'm going off the rails. Um, so Boolean is, uh, is like a different name for a checkbox. So that's true or false on the grid, um, like we're seeing here, active true or false. It's a checkbox. Um, and then say this applies to the vendor record. Okay. So once we select those things, now we're adding a brand new field. What we're going to add is um do did they submit a w9 and then the um so the order let's make this order one and um i'm gonna enter these things and i'll, I'll explain to you how they work together um so the property name is like kind of what's going to be used in the background to designate this field. Um, you might see it on like reports or if you were to pull like uh, with field names, um, the Excel field names option um, from a grid. The group is going to designate which one of these categories. So do you see these headers here? So we want to put this in the 1099 category. So what we're going to do is for group, we're going to enter 1099. Now the order is going to designate where within this group do I want it. So if I put number one, it's going to scooch it up here to the start. Um, if I put number like if I wanted it at the end, maybe I put like I just put 99. I could probably go see, you know, I could try to see if 10 works or whatnot. But um, but if you wanted it, so like say this one you know, if you want it between this one and this one, then it might be like a number in the middle of whatever order those ones have designated. Um, but let's just make this easy. We'll put it as number one. We'll go ahead and save that up. And let's refresh this. And now when we look at Lacey under 1099 group, number one, we have W9 received. So um, now when we have that, we can go ahead and check it, save it. And here's the beauty of this field. It's now on my more option. I can add this right to my grid. And now that I have it on there, so I could go through and like fill this out, you know, for um, my vendors. And um, if I have the W9 and it's checked that I know at a glance, like if that's something that I need to get for this vendor, then I could, you know, see if I still needed that. Um, and then this one's interesting. We have another custom field that was in here with the W9 date. So, so see, this one's a date field um, in all of those different options you have when um, creating. Here's the Here's the different types, date and time, email fields. And this didn't, like the vendor is our example, but look at all of these different pages that we could potentially add these to. So if you had um, something that you wanted to show on like a requisition, um, you could, you know. And so um, if they have other things they're looking for, I think that this could be a really helpful solution. 
but you know definitely not something you're gonna be using every day uh but but great to know that it's here all righty so uh, next we're gonna hop to modules. And I mentioned the modules when we were on the configuration page because some of those modules will only appear, I'm sorry, some of those configuration options will only appear based on the modules that are installed. Um, so what this is, so um, within the instance, there are some things that are essentially like optional, right? So accounts receivable, that's a module that can be turned on and then that adds certain menu options up here. Um, so different like functions within the system can either be turned on or turned off with these modules. Uh, this is where you see what's installed and this is also where you can update. Um, so accounts receivable, this is either like a plus is I can add this if it's not already added. A minus is I can uninstall it. This is where it shows me, you know, is it installed? Yes, no. Uh, so, so accounts receivable. Um, actually, you know what? I'm not going to turn that one off. Um, EIS classic integration. This is something it had a configuration option. Um, there's a couple like icons that happen throughout the system. Email notification services. I mentioned that, you know, when we looked at that entire um, email setup. If I were to uninstall this, that will no longer be there. This is also where you turn on things like if um, you are using LDAP um, or even like mass change can be enabled through here and um, items like the workflow module. This is absolutely something that we cover in more detail um, in the intermediate training and um, we have again in the wiki we have descriptions of each one of these so um all of those do different things and they're you know it's worth um it's worth looking into if there are like specifics if there's one that you're, you're wanting to turn on <laughs> oh oh let's talk about though you know what and this is perfect we're just looking at vendors so okay so here's our vendor so we had all of um, these information. We have amounts, 1099, new hire, other info, right? This ACH processing module. So um, right now, we we don't have a way to create an ACH tape through through USAS. That's that's not available yet um, to actually like make the tape. Like like you are you can generate like a check print file from um use us but you can't actually like we're not actually doing the ach part however third parties do allow you to make a 30 uh sorry an ach um tape file using the disbursement information um but they need like a couple other fields and, and we had those fields in classic and so um as long as those are included on the xml there is a way that like districts can end up making it even though it doesn't happen in USAS. And so what this first module on here does, if I click the plus, it's going to install it. It may not take, uh, take effect until the page is refreshed. And if I come back over to my vendor grid now, what this does is it adds um, these fields down here, ACH info it adds all of these fields that can then be put um, when you're actually making a disbursement, it can be put on um, the XML file and then um, it can be put on the XML file and then used by that third party to make the ACH tape. So if, they, if they're if they wanting to use those fields, it won't just show for everybody. It'll only show um, if they want it and they turn on them and that, that module is turned on for them. So that one's a good example of how those modules work. Um, okay. Let's see. Um, just want to make sure I cover all of the ones there. Okay. Okay. Well, we're doing pretty good. All right. All right. This next one, this is like, this is um, 
somewhere that I go a lot. And I think this can be really helpful to you. So we're going to, um, not utilities, we're going to system monitor. Again, this is an admin page. So this is something that you can go to. Um, but what this does is this gives you information on events that happen throughout the system. So if you have a district coming to you saying X, Y, Z happened, and like maybe they got an error message, maybe something took a long time, um, this gives you a lot, a lot, a lot of information that you can use to help troubleshoot, um, or even in some cases, like send to us to help us help you um, with what's happening. And um, so once we're in here, so this very first page is events, and we have a drop down. There are a bunch of different kinds of events here. Uh, this first one shows slow metric events. And um, I actually was just talking about this with the prioritization committee yesterday, because we have had, um, we've done a lot to uh, make new reports on the canned reports, again, that we'll talk about tomorrow, but um, we've added some new reports to help improve performance and running times. Um, but we do still have some districts with um, a large chart of accounts or, you know, whatever the situation is that, you know, if they say that they had a report that took a long time, we do want to know that. We want you to let us know. Um, but what we need is we need a little bit more specific information sometimes where, like, it took a long time might not be the same thing to me that it does to you that it does to them. So what really helps us is if we can say like, this is how long it took, you know, for them and have like more of a specific estimate. And this page right here will give you that information. So if they come and say, hey, I had a budget summary, it took a really long time. On here, I can see things like, here's when this started. And this is my, look at this is my amended certificate that I was running earlier. So we ran this this morning. It started at 9.46 and it ended uh, at 9.46.45 and it ended at 9.46.52. So from these two entries and the timestamps on them, I can see that this took, you know what, like eight seconds run. Um, but you can do the math between those and, you know, and you can figure out, oh yeah, this is how long this report took. And I totally understand. Like, if a report is taking a long time, like they might walk away. Like, they're not looking at their clock the whole time. And that's completely understandable. So, like, it might have taken five minutes, it might have taken 10 minutes. Like, hopefully, we hope we don't want them to take that long. But if it does, and then we need to know about it, like this is where you can find that information without having to like ask them to run it again, because of course they probably don't want to, you know. So, um, so this gives you at the ITC like hands-on access to some of this information so that you can help. Um, so this is just slow events. So obviously that, that was not the most fun to talk about because we don't like when that happens. Um, but life cycle events. So here's another one. This is, um, a lot of this information is from like, uh, if the instance like was restarted and then this is saying like, oh yeah, I started these modules, like this came up. Um, this is kind of general processing and um, auditable events. So this one, you can see right here, look at module installed event. Someone went into that module page and turned the module on. Oh, it was the ACH module. That's what I just did. So if somebody turned something on and you need a record of when that happened, I can see exactly that that was turned on on this date. Um, here's who did it. I'm logged in under admin right now. And then here's what was done. So that one's really helpful. Um, and then, you know, these other ones I don't use a whole lot, so I'm not going to spend too much time there. Um, again, also with these tabs, <laughs> there's a lot going on here, so we are going to skip a few. Um, but status, so this status tab is next. And I'll tell you this one. Um, I think there are two situations really where you would probably use this one. And the first is going to be when you migrate a district, when you spin them up on redesign and it's you loaded them today and you're getting ready to run your balancing reports. Um, this is a good one to check because when the instance first comes up, sometimes it takes some time for things to calculate. 
So on here, look, I can see activity ledger, I can see the encumbrance ledger job expenditure. And, and what these are is that when the district, um, when like the instance spins up, it starts to calculate, hey, here's what the encumbrances would calculate to. Uh, here's, you know, the activity ledger, here's adding all of these things from the purchase order page and the disbursement page and the receipts page, adding those to and compiling them for the activity ledger. So when it, when it starts, it puts all those pieces in place. Now, these tell you if it's completed, um, if it's still in progress, it'll tell you that. So like, if you just migrated a district and you run a report and you see zero encumbrances, it might, it, it might be fine. Like, it's not that the encumbrances like aren't there necessarily. If this encumbrance job is still running, it might just not have calculated yet. So that's where this is gonna help you because you can go see. Um, there are times where this might fail on the import and that might indicate like import errors. And so that would also be helpful to see on this grid. Um, so, so really help, and, and you know, if you're asking us for help sometimes to redirect you here to, to check these things. So this is the page um, if we're asking you about these jobs to come to. Um, the, the second reason, or the second like time, I guess you might come here is uh, maybe not for uh, when you first imported, but if you are restarting uh, an instance. So sometimes if you have a ticket with us, we'll say, hey, can you restart the instance? And um, in that case, it you know would also spin up and there might be, again, calculations that it takes a little bit of time to do. And the way to see if those are completed would be here. Um, let's see. So the metrics tab, uh, we can look at this one, but this one is uh, mainly for the tech personnel at the ITC. Um, this is heap information and database threads, which is not something that I use, um, but just so you know, this is, this is what this one shows. <laughs> um, again, logging this one is um, more for us. Uh, if we need to ask you to turn something on here, honestly, even like it's above me, like the developers use this to get more detail out of errors if they need it. But this is definitely not one that you'll be coming into regularly. Okay, so this next one, application log. This one's my favorite. So, Sometimes on tickets, we'll ask you for an app log and then you'll send us and we'll look at where to where to get that from too. But, um, and you'll send us, you know, the text file and that, if you look at that, it's like not something that, that kind of like, you know, makes a whole lot of sense. It's something the developers use and they can read it. Like um, <laughs> they make sense out of it and it astounds me. But this is like our version of that where we can get some information. We can kind of see what's happening. And, you know, there's still a lot here. It, it can still be a lot, but it, it at least gives us a way to kind of access some information. Um, if, if anything, accessing this may just even help with like what you're relating to us on tickets. So what this does is it keeps track of events that happen in the system. And it organizes it into this grid here, the level. So we have informational messages, we have errors, and um, there are warnings in here too, which I don't wanna to scroll too much, but you might also see warn. Um, I like to, so a lot of times when I'm in here, it's because someone got an error and I'm trying to find more detail on it. Um, say you have a district that said, I was posting a purchase order and I got an error and, you know, I'm not sure why. Well, if you can get them, if you can like figure out a roundabout time that they were doing that, you might be able to get more detail on this error from this page, you know, even though they've X'd out and moved on and, you know, and don't have the error for you like readily available. So um, I like to filter this by error sometimes, though you certainly don't have to. 
Um, and then, so say, look at 915. So at 915, I have an error, error here. So um, if I find something, now this is, look at duplicate key, uh, the budget scenario name was duplicate, budget 23 already exists. So remember, I was, I tried to save that scenario, but I forgot I already had one, so I had to change the name. So this is just a record, a record that that happened, a record of what the error was. Now, if I click, I just click directly on this line, uh, so directly on this row, and it pops up this detail. And if I scroll down, okay, I get a little bit more detail. I don't see a whole lot here, um, but this one happened at like the same time too. So let's see, okay, boom. So exception, this is the same time, the same timestamp. And if I go down here, look at, I can see this is the same error. Now, when you are putting in tickets, if you get an error like this and you need and you like send in a ticket to us, um, especially if it's something that we might need to end up escalating to the developers, this exception detail right here is so, so helpful. So if this is something you're able to find and include on your ticket, that might really help expedite the process of, you know, what we can do to help and um, figure out, you know, an error message because this one's straightforward. It was a duplicate, but they're not always like that. Um, so what you want to do is I would just click copy all of this, copy, and then you could open notepad, wordpad, uh, word, um, I like to use notepad plus plus right here. Um, and that should, I think that's, that should be on your computer. Um, but basically you just want like something you can save a txt file to and you can just paste that error in there save it to your computer and attach that to the ticket that can be so so helpful um, for us investigating you know what's causing a problem for your district um and so if you um see you know this one has a description here um down here we have like the duplicate key value. So sometimes they have a little bit more detail, um, but yeah, that can be excellent. Now, Pat had mentioned yesterday with getting the error, when the error pops up and there's the little button where you can expand and show the error detail and you can copy it from there too. Um, so this is like the same, it's the same content. And so it's still helpful for us, but like this is kind of your alternate option to what she talked about where if you missed it on the on the error pop up or like the district got the pop up and they closed out of it, this is like your way to go back and still access that. Um, so yeah, so so that's really helpful. Um, the other thing is, so let's let's click out of here and look at um, the information, uh, the informational ones, because this is another spot where like, look at this one. So I can see the module um, installed event went off. So that's me installing the ACH module. So that's just kind of another record. So especially if there are things that are happening at certain points in time for your district, like, oh, at like 7 a.m. it's acting weird. You know, like if there's something that has a certain time, like this can kind of just tell you what the system's doing at what time. So um, those are a couple examples, but I've probably found, you know, so many, so many things where just, you don't even, you don't even always need to know what you're looking for when you come here. <laughs> if you know, like something odd's happening at some time, it's just helpful to check and see like what's going on in the application that might be, might be related. Um, okay. So that's me preaching about the app log. <laughs> I love it. I can't help it. <laughs> um, all right. So uh, let's go to threads. And this is another one that um, I'm not even sure that I need to show you because um, it is you know, definitely a page for developers. Um, admin logs is the other one. And um, admin logs, so this, <laughs> this is always tough because in my demo instance, I don't have anything here. Um, if you look at this in any one of your in instances, so your monitor admin logs, what you are going to see here is one line, one row. And that one row is going to show you your classic import. So when you imported classic, 
it's going to have a line here. It actually says the date, which like when I'm looking at your instances um, from SSDT, you know, if I'm helping and I'm looking in a backup, sometimes you, it's really helpful to know like, oh, this was the date they imported because am I looking at a transaction that was imported or that was created in redesign that's becoming less relevant as we go on as more people have been on um, redesign longer. But, but, you know, if you don't know offhand and you just need to know, um, that's nice. Also, when they first migrate, there is a way that you can see the in-system uh, log, uh, import log. So, so that's what admin logs is, even though it's a ghost on my page. Um, the info tab, again, this is a techie one. This is one that we are not gonna use. Um, so this might be something, um, either like you're referred to, to, you know, hey, can you tell us what this specific thing says? Or, you know, maybe your, your technology team will use this. Um, yeah. Let's go to security though. So security, this is a new one. Uh, we actually just added this uh, within like the last uh, month or two. And um, what this is, is looks like a whole lot of text here, um, but it's really, it's, it's security. So it's telling you authentication events. So um, if you needed to see information related to like logging in, failed passwords, um, and, and it's, it's like events that happened because we're going to look at the users later and, and be able to see, you know, information on a specific user. But like this is just kind of telling you, you know, when certain things are happening related to um, authentication and logins. And um, so that's kind of just something that, you um, yeah, added as a security measure, helpful for reference, probably not something you'll be in all the time, but when you need it, it's here. Okay, and then server logs. So I believe like at the very beginning of the training yesterday, Pat showed in the help about section, um, there is a little button where you can like send the log to SSDT. And that one, it's the quick and easy way to go. It sends the log in, in the help section from today. So it'll send the app log to us from today, we can receive it. Now, there are some situations where like, if we're helping you out with something um, for the district that maybe happened like yesterday or two days ago, then we might not be able to look at the app log from today because that wouldn't have the information we need. So in that case, we would say, hey, can you send us the app log from yesterday? And where you're going is system monitor server logs tab. And so this current is today, but the, there would actually be, and like, this is a demo database. So I don't have it set where it's like, um, it's like, so if it resets, then we can't see past that. Like if it's restarted. Um, but generally in a normal live district, you would have ones that say the previous dates. So if that's the case and, and that's something that um, you need, you know, to send, then, then this is where you'd find it. All right, cool. The cache, again, this is one that um, you're, you're not going to use. I'm not going to um, really go into this one. That's not something you'll use uh, regularly. But just to review then, I'd say probably app log and events are really in stat status sometimes. But app log and events are probably like the two main ones that um, I use within here and I think would be helpful for you. All righty. Okay, yeah, yeah. Any any questions about any of um, these pieces? Okay, well, we'll move right along then. Next up, I'm gonna go to roles. And okay, so the roles, um, a lot of these come in, at, like a lot of these will just automatically be in here when you get started in redesign. Um, they're based off of classic roles so that they're consistent with the same permissions. Uh, but what a role essentially is, is it is a grouping of permissions to parts of the software. Uh, what this does is it defines what pages that a user can see and can access. Um, 
so when we very first started yesterday, Pat mentioned, you know, we're going to be using an admin account for these trainings. So I can see all of these menu options. I can access all of these pages. I have view icons, I have edit icons, I have delete icons on like every grid I look at because I got full blown everything. Um, but obviously like every user that's gonna be in a district isn't going to have that. So these roles are what helps determine, um, you know, those where, where it's restricted a little bit more too. Um, so we have some of these standard ones. So, um, the USAS manager, probably something maybe like the treasurer level would have. So that's like the highest um, like district level access usually. USAS standard is regular, um, probably for like your treasurer's office um, folk that has like uh, the transaction um, access where they can, you know, create most types of, they can create all types of transactions. Uh, read only is they can um, see see all the information but they can't actually uh, make updates and then usas rec is somebody who just enters requisitions um i don't mean to uh to be repetitive here but but um this is another thing the wiki page actually spells out like the permissions for each one of these so i'm going to use the usas rec as an example so that we can kind of see you know how this works um and what this looks like for a user, but if there's another one um, that you are interested in knowing like what's involved in there, then I would refer to that. Um, it's really, um, it's all mapped out there. So um, the other thing that we're gonna talk about is that any of these that have an underscore um, plus the administrators is a standard role that SSDT has created and put in the software. But you see these other ones in here are customized roles. And that is something that you are able to do in here is sort of customize and take um, certain permissions and attach those, you know, either in addition to or like create a fully custom role. And so we'll go through examples, but um, you have more flexibility instead of just having this standard blanket access um, for each user. Um, I do know that, you know, with the SOC 1 audit, they um, do keep track of like, um, like roles or permissions assigned um, through that. So you may need to make sure that if you're assigning custom roles, you take the proper um, steps there to ensure that, you know, whether it's like um, getting, you know, district like permission um, forms or, or something like that. So, so like this is something that you'll want to make sure you're following proper procedures if you decide to do, but the software uh, does allow you to have this, uh, this way to customize. So, okay, let's start. Let's look at USAS Rec. So first, I just kind of want to look at this because I've mentioned, okay, a role is a group of permissions, but like, what does that mean? So when I open up this role, so this is the role name, and then over here, this is what's granted. So this is everything that's included within this role. So um, each one of these designates like a page, um, and then like what functionality they can do on that page. So requisition, uh, like a USAS rec only, they can create requisitions, they can delete, they can view. Um, but then when it comes to like vendors, they can only view vendors, but they can't actually like edit or delete vendors. So they have this like permission specific to view. Um, and each one of these, so like this, this permission here, would actually grant um, everything underneath it. If they uh, like just had view like they do for vendor, then they can only view. Um, like basically these are broken out so that you could um, add or take away ones, you know, that, that you don't want whatever role to have. So if you're customizing, it gives you a little bit of room to um, decide just which functions of that page a user should have, a role should have. Uh, so this is what this one looks like as a standard role. And um, you know what, this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna hop around a little bit, but I just wanna show this because I think it just makes a little bit more sense. Um, so I'm gonna log out of here. And this one we can't do with two pages. 
So I have an Amanda user. And um, when I come in here, I'm going to get a bunch of pop-ups, even though I always try and say never. Um, but when I come in here, my Amanda user only has the USS rec only role right now. So when I look at the reports that I have here, I just have um, reports specific to requisitions. Uh, under transaction menu, I only can see requisitions. So those permissions that we just looked at on that little pop-up only had access for requisition transactions. So that's all that's even going to show on my menu. And if I come in here, I can see these requisitions and I, I could create, I could edit, I could delete. So I have all of those options within this page because those permissions said that I could. But the other one that we saw was vendor. Now, vendors and accounts, I have these on my menu because I, I had permissions related to them. But when I come to the vendor screen, I only have this view icon because I only had the permission that said view. So here's Lacey. I can view Lacey, um, but I have no option to edit um, these adjustments. I can't actually create them. I can just view them. And so, you know, that's really locked down just based on the, the role that I have and the permissions that are included in that role. So let's go back. Like I said, we're going to hop around a little bit here, but I, I think that this is going to be good to see. Um, so I'm going back to my system roles. Now, say that I want to give my Amanda user a little bit more to see. So they have a rec only, or they have USAS rec. Um, but if I want to let any, if I want to let um, that user also see purchase orders, I can do that. Um, and I actually have two different options for how to do that. <laughs> so this would give you flexibility depending on like, you know, how many users they might want to add it to, you know, what's the most convenient, how you want to organize it. Um, but there are two different ways that would do essentially the same thing. So I'm going to show you both and then you can kind of decide uh, if, if this is something you're doing, which way you want to go. So, okay. So you says rec. So if I want to add something in addition to USAS rec, I could just make another role. Uh, users can have more than one role attached to them. So purchase order view and a description. And then, okay, here's a little trick. So <laughs> when we look at this available side, this is all the permissions that they could potentially have, they could possibly have. So this is like everything in here and it's a lot. Um, so you could scroll through, you know, and try and find, okay, I want to view purchase orders, um, but on my keyboard, I'm going to do control and F at the same time. And that gives me my little find window. I use this on reports too. <laughs> um, but that little control F shortcut is for finding and, and it's so helpful. And so that'll work on this window. If I type in, so I typed in purchase, here's my purchase order permissions. I want purchase order view. So I click that, move that over. And um, now I have this role that also has this permission. Well, this role specifically only has this permission. So I would really just use this one in addition to um, like an existing role. And we will, um, so you actually assign these roles on the user page, which we're going to finish up there, but I'm going to hop there for like a quick minute to assign this. Um, but let me show you your other option for roles. So the other thing that I could do, so so as this is now, I could give the user USAS rec and I could give them per disorder view and they'd have rec only plus being able to view that. Um, I also instead could, um, I would do edit. Now, here's a trick. I can't actually edit and save um, one of the standard roles. Like I can't overwrite a standard role because those are standard. SSTT, you know, has those documented. We give those to everybody in the software. Those should be the same. What I can do though, is I can copy it. So the way I do that is I can say, I can just change the ID and then when I save it, this will actually save as a new role. So um, if I go ahead and change the ID, let me say, let's 
say that and then use my trick here to go ahead and find purchase order, uh, purchase order view, move this over. And now that's added on this list. So this new role is gonna have all of these permissions. So I'll go ahead and save that. And now I have this role as well. So uh, we're just skipping ahead just for a quick minute to give this to our user, but I promise we'll come back and talk more about um, the details of this user screen. Um, but let's go ahead and edit. So the first thing we can do is our user has USAS rec. We give it purchase order view, save that up, log out. All right, so now we have, still can see accounts and vendors, still can um, do anything we want with the requisitions. Purchase orders though, now we can come in, I can see purchase orders, but I can just view them. I cannot edit them, can't you know clone, create, uh, change them in any way. I can just view them because the permission I gave was to view. Now my alternate option was like that whole new role that I um, created. Oops, I wanna go to users. And so if I wanted to use that other option instead, what I would do is I would take both of these off and I would give them, where'd it go? This role instead. And then if I saved that, if I logged back in now, I'd see exactly the same thing I just saw. So I, I don't know, I'm gonna jump around again to do that but um, that's kind of like a instead of. And again, like, you know, if this is something that you're gonna do, I wanna show you both of those options because like, if you are wanting to like add this for users that already have rec only, then maybe it's easier just to do an additional one instead of having to like take them off, put them back on. If you're, you have a district that's like, adding new users and they wanna have this, you know, maybe it's easier just to make the new role. So. However, however it works for you, um, both of those will give them the same thing. Uh, let's see. Okay, so that that was the roles. Um, why do I keep ending up on the utilities menu? Let's talk about rules now. Okay, so the rules are interesting and definitely you know, a, a bit above like the, the straight beginner level, but good for you to know that these are here. Uh, see like the general um, with how they work. Uh, there is even like you could create custom rules and stuff, which that is like definitely, that might even be like more than <laughs> intermediate because I've written a couple of rules, but um, they certainly are more, more on like the developer side. Uh, but this grid is very helpful for you to see what's in the system um, as far as rules go and what's enabled because what these rules do is they dictate certain things within the software. So if we're just kind of looking at this grid here, we can see like errors. So um, this dictates maybe like when they would get a certain warning or a certain error, uh, you know, things they can or can't do in the software. And this gives you some view to like how that works. Um, and why they might be getting a certain error. Now, these columns that we have over here really help us uh, give some context to these. So mandatory rules are something that they have to have turned on. Like SSDT, put them in here. These are required for the software. This is how, you know, how it needs, it needs this to function. So if it's mandatory, these are not things that you can turn off basically. Um, if it's not mandatory, then you can see this enabled column means, is it turned on? So is it currently applying in the software? And if I look here, so look, true, you know, well, these are authentication, but let's look for like an error. So, okay, an error, active account, um, and that has to do with the disbursements. So this is not mandatory, but it is enabled. So if you had a situation, you had a district that like said, hey, I don't want it to give me an error when this happens. I wanna be able to post against that. 
well, if this isn't mandatory, then like you could come in here, you can disable it and then save. And then they would no longer get the error when the specific situation happens. And that's okay, then they're allowed to do that. Um, now, after you actually click to enable or dis disable a rule and then save it here, you do also need to click the activate button in order to put any changes that you make on this grid, you need to do activate and that'll like actually update the rule either from um, enabled or disabled. There are some other things that happen, you know, in the system with those, with like changing the status of those rules. Um, so that's why it needs that, that extra um, step there to activate it. Um, and if you're changing multiple rules, like you could go enable three rules and then activate them all at once. Um, so the other thing here is uh, we have this create. And like I said, creating a rule from scratch is like, something I've, I've barely done. Um, I think we did give a training a while back where I talked about some of the more details of like the things that you see in these rules. But um, as, a, as we're going beginner today, like, again, obviously these can be a lot. Um, however, you still have kind of an option where, where you can uh, maybe do something with this. And um, we're headed right back to the wiki. So use test documentation. Um, I'm going to go to system rules and I have this section here that says custom rules. So what we have here is like these, you know, it's not something that every district might want, like some, you know, some districts use requisitions in the software, some don't. Um, so what we have is we have this set of custom rules that like we've just created that have been maybe requested at some point or something like that. But if you have a district that's wanting something like this, you know, I don't expect that you're going to be in there writing rules right away, but you can come in here and copy these custom rules and add them still. So um, what I would do to add, so say, okay, this is require a delivered to address when creating a requisition. So um, if I want to be able to turn this on so that if someone puts in a requisition, they don't select a deliver to address. I want it to give them an error and not let it save. So what I would do and come in here, copy this, go to my software, and this is the text. Paste that in here. Okay, boom. Um, and then look, I even have the name. And I have this. Now I might customize that that name with like the district name or something like that, but just for the um, sense of our test, I'm gonna leave it as is. And then we'll have it enabled and then I can validate. Perfect, it's valid. And then I could save that and um, I have it enabled. So once I activate, now I have a custom role in my database. It was that easy. So that's the thing, you don't have to be, you know, you don't have to go into the specifics of like all of, you know, this part of the setup. But there are several rules out here that you could still add um, if these are things that your district might want. So that can be really handy. Um, let's see. Yeah, so I think, okay, so um, the, the other thing that I want to mention on here, and we're gonna see when we get on the user page, um, and we didn't, I didn't point it out when we were on modules, but one thing that comes up So I'm typing in user-based balance. Now there is a module for user-based balance checking and there are several rules that are related to this. So if I just did like user-based balance and so I'm looking for these rules that have it in the name is these are all um, warnings or like warning slash errors that you can turn on if the district wants to have balances checked when like a user tries to enter a transaction. And so here, like, for example, it's saying like a negative balance check on a requisition, and this is for the budget, and this is for the appropriation. So if you have districts that are wanting to have, um, you know, when the user's entering a certain type of transaction, 
if the budget is negative, then they can't enter it. Um, there is setup that's on this user page that we're going to see in a minute. And that does like apply. That's how they set it up. But it works in conjunction with these rules because there's different things. So like this is where they could say, I want balances checked on purchase orders and requisitions and future requisitions on, you know, distributions, or like maybe they just want it to be checked on purchase orders, you know, like these rules kind of help them customize it further. So keep that in mind. So we'll, we'll talk about those fields in like the basic setup, but you know, these are important too, if that is something that you have a district using. Okay. So we are on users, which is our last topic for today. So we're doing really good here. Um, so on our users grid, so this is where you would see, um, you know, this is where you would see all of the users in the system. Um, I have my Amanda user here, and this is what we were looking at um, for when we kind of glanced over for roles. So I'm just going to go ahead and continue looking at this one. And um, so we have a couple things here. So username, this is what I use to log in. This is what I'm going to type for my username, you know, when I type with my password. And um, so so I just did edit to open this. Um, I guess I'll just say this now before I get too deep into this page. <laughs> Uh, view is if I just wanted to look at this information. Um, and then this one also has a change password option. So this little key is where I actually set the password. So password comes from here. The username comes from this very first uh, field on um, the user view. Name. That would just be, that's going to go here for the grid. Um, title. Uh, put my email address in there and then okay assigned roles so this is where we looked at the roles we could assign again we could assign one we could assign multiple you know say I want to give this user let's give them the file archive access to so they can see reports there um, so that's where you would assign those different roles uh, this next one is filters so we are going to talk about the filters tomorrow as far as creating those, what exactly they are and how they work. But um, the filter is essentially going to be um, where the roles will show you what pages you can see. The filters is more specific to the content of the account codes that you can see. So my requisition only user could go to the expenditure grid and see the accounts there. If I additionally apply a filter on here that says they can only see certain funds or certain you know, objects, then um, I can assign that using this option and then that will filter down the content they actually see on the pages that they're um, given, specifically for account codes. The created date, so this is when my user was created. Selectable group chains. So this is specific to workflows. Um, if they have workflows, group chains are um, basically like who, what, what group of approvers they can submit um, requisitions to. And so one, it kind of works the same as the roles. Like one or multiple could be selected, um, and this is defined on the user page. All right, next is this requisition prefixes. Okay, and so we even have like a pop up here and I'm gonna um, read this because I think this is relevant. So um, entering the requisition prefixes here allows the user to see requisitions with, with the specified prefixes. Multiple prefixes must be separated by commas, no space. Um, entering prefixes without checking the box um, won't, won't restrict them. So um, here's the thing. If I just use this box, I can put my requisition prefix in here. Um, now, and I, and I think Pat mentioned it yesterday when we were looking at requisitions, is when those numbers auto assign, so if they're entering a requisition, they leave the requisition number blank. Um, 
basically like they they probably a lot of districts want um there to be like a user specific requisition number series so like if i'm going to enter requisitions i want all of my requisitions to start with my initials and then it'd be like asf 001 002 and have that same order continue so first and foremost what this field does is give the prefix that it'll use for my number series on top of that it has additional function if i check this box so if i check restrict requisitions now what that's going to do is my user now it will be assigned starting with this number but now i can only see requisitions that start with this prefix so if i were to go log in as this user go to my requisitions grid i can't see requisitions starting with any other number other than the series that's here which is my own which would be my own so that's how that works um now here's the thing um and in, and in classic uh it used to be so that um, it used to be like a user would only be able to see their own requisition. So like they usually start with their own prefix, but they'd only see the ones that they entered. Um, this became difficult sometimes because what if that person took over for somebody else? Or what if they helped other users with their requisitions? You know, then they couldn't, they could only see their own. And that was kind of tough, like if, unless they had higher level access, which they didn't necessarily need. Um, but this, is, this solves that. So um, I can see here right now, I can only see my own, but my um, tooltip said I can enter multiple. So if I also need to see Pat's requisitions and Michelle's requisitions, I could enter in multiple like starting series, multiple prefixes, and now I can see all three of those. Whichever one is first is what mine will assign as. So that is um, important to note, but you can enter multiple. So, you know, this way, like I can see um, any that match those parameters. You can have, you know, um, if, if they had, you know, more or less, they just had two. Um, so they have some flexibility there. I think that's really nice um, as far as adding that. So that's how that works. And then balance checking. So <laughs> this goes back to those rules we we're looking at, the module that um, can be enabled. So if those things are in place, this is what's going to um, tie into that from the user setup. So um, balance checking, um, it, is, it can be set, you know, it's configured specific to this user that I'm on. And these first two are allowing negative appropriation and allowing negative budgets. So if these are checked, then they are allowed to have to post to a negative budget. If these are unchecked, then they're not allowed. And if they try to post like, you know, a PO and it would cause a negative budget, they will get an error and they will not be able to post that transaction um, to that budget unless like more is allocated or, you know, whatnot. But yeah, they would get an error if these are if these are not checked, they're not allowed. Um, the last one here is warning. So maybe they are allowed, but you want them to get a warning that says, hey, you're going to do this. Are you sure? Um, so the warning would probably be like can be used within conjunction of the of the users that are allowed. And again, this the so the module needs to be on the rules. So it's like, see, we have appropriation, we have budget. So the types of transactions this applies for is very integrated with uh, the modules and the rules. So, you know, keep that in mind. And then we have um, account, account and password expiration dates. So this password expiration right here, um, I love this section of uh, pages that we're covering today because we have so much stuff that is intertwined. Um, password expiration. Uh, the configuration that we looked at that said 90 days. So when I set the password, it went and figured out what's 90 days and it updated this date here from the last time I reset the password. Um, enabled, so my user is enabled. This would show like if a user is locked. Um, if a user 
uh, like if uh, if you are an ITC that uses external authentication, um, like um, yeah, so if you have external authentication set up, then this checkbox would be used to like signify that the password's actually not going to be like the use as configured password. Um, and then there is actually, we added like a mass change so you can mass update users to that. If that's something like you're not using, but then you start using. Uh, so just like a side note, uh, that's an option. And then the last time they logged in, and these are checkboxes, like if their account or password is expired, the system uses those to, you know, help signify like if they shouldn't be able to uh, be allowed to log in. Uh, but let's save this up. That populates my uh, information that I added here. And, um, and that's good to go. So let me just double check. I think we hit everything on this page. Okay, awesome. Um, let me pull this up here. So um, that covers what we needed to cover for today. Um, if you have questions, uh, certainly please put those in the chat or um, speak up, but I, um, done with the with the basics of what we're going to cover tomorrow we are going to start by talking about uh reports so you know obviously those kind of come up through our sessions yesterday and today and we'll talk about um the different kinds of reports we'll touch on like the custom report creator um and then we're also going to go through the utilities and so that utilities menu you know some of the stuff like the account filters um and just the additional stuff on that utilities menu we'll go through. Um, miscellaneous kind of just talking about some resources that um, may be helpful to you as you are navigating through the system and um, um, and different things like that. So um, awesome. Well, thank you all so much for attending today. Um, and um, if you're catching the recording, thanks for watching and um, happy St. Patrick's Day. Uh, so I hope everyone has a good one and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thanks.